Um, I have a lot of energy, so let's go. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. God in your life, and you can turn your whole life around, not because of, of Lamborghinis and mansions, but because of the person that you become, because of the man that you're going to come, because of the change of perspective that happens here. If you think you're in the wrong place, let me just give a little rundown about the Salvation Army, okay? 1865, there was a man named William Booth, and he was walking the streets of London, okay? He saw homeless and alcoholics on the side of the road, and he wondered why nobody would help them. So he tried to bring them into regular churches. And all the regular churches, the normies, they all said that they didn't want them in there because they all stunk. They smelled. They didn't want them in there. So Catherine Booth and William Booth, that's husband and wife, created the Salvation Army Ministry for addicts, alcoholics, homeless people, just like us, so we can finally turn our life over to the King of Kings. Let me give the Salvation Army a, a hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right, baby. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for everything that you do, Father. Please help me decrease as you increase in our life right now, Father. Please continue to soak in these men's heart, Father. Please continue to let them know that they're trying to seize the moment with good intent. They're trying to do the right thing so they can finally change their behaviors and they can become new men on this planet. We know that the program is hard at first, Father, but we know that once we get through the program, how thankful we are that we made it through. As we walk out of here and we let the Lord shine through our vessel, we're so thankful for the gifts that you give us, the best words in the dictionary, joy, hope, uh, faithfulness, forgiveness, all these amazing words. And we thank you so much for self-control so we're able to finally protect the vessel from the fiery arrows of the devil. And we love you and we thank you, Lord, for the Salvation Army for giving us chance after chance to get this life, this life right. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen, guys. So I'm going to share a little bit about my testimony, okay? At 19 years old, um, I, I was drafted by the Houston Astros. So I was offered um, $120,000 by the Houston Astros. And I did not know, I, I did not have the foundation to be able to handle that kind of money. That was in the year 2000. So $120,000 was quite a bit of money. And I didn't have the foundation to be able to handle that type, type of money. Or I didn't have the foundation to be able to handle life on life terms. So what I decided to do was chase pleasures because I didn't walk with God at that time. I didn't have a moral code. I didn't have a moral compass. So I chased women. I chased booze. I chased drugs. I chased instant gratification. And I ended up blowing all that money. But because if we chase pleasures, pleasures are never enough. We always need the next pleasure. You'll never be satisfied and you'll never be fulfilled. So 27 years old now, right? I signed in 19. Now 27 years old. I'm making my way up to the Houston Astros organization. I'm doing pretty well. I'm smoking weed after games. I'm drinking after games. You know what I'm saying? I'm continuing to grow as a person. But at 27 years old, because I chase pleasures, I decide to put amphetamine in my body. I didn't need to do that. I didn't need to put amphetamine in my body. My life was good. I was six foot four, 220 pounds, throwing 92 miles an hour, playing in front of 15,000 fans, brand new Tundra, making six thousand dollars a month. I had everything that you would ever want as a person, as a human being. But because I chased pleasures, I wanted more. And this is the moment that my life literally went into a whole other direction. I went from being a pro athlete to now a road of being a straight street junkie. Because the drugs are a false fact into your brain. What they do is they go into the dopamine system and they give you all this joy and all this happiness. You're supposed to find joy from a hard day's work. Walking right with God. Being the father that you always needed. Being a good person. Being at service. These are the things that give you joy. But what the drug does, it's a false hack and within five minutes, boom, I thought I found a limitless pill. I was like, oh my gosh, I need this for the rest of my life. So what they say is the drugs disguise themselves as heaven and they ended up taking us straight to hell. And that's the sad thing is that we have a God-shaped void within our bodies and the drugs actually fill that void for just a short amount of time. Not very long, but a short amount of time. So we believe that we need this for the rest of our entire lives. And that night I went out and pitched four innings and I struck out 10 guys. I was super calm. I thought I found the limit of this pill. I went and drank all night long and I woke up with no hangover and I thought I found God. I said, oh my God, I need this drug. Not, lo and behold, I was, it was Adderall which I tried, which is prescribed to you by a doctor. So the next day, I was suited and booted, and I was ready to go to the doctor and get prescribed this medication. For two years, it was amazing, but the thing is, I wasn't eating when I was, I, I wasn't eating when I wasn't, when I was hungry. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping when I was tired, and my physical ability was starting to dwindle. So now we look four years later, and now, this is only four years later. This is not ten years later. This is four 
four years later, now I'm playing in Canada. Now I'm 180 pounds because the disease is progressive. Now I'm 180 pounds. My trunk, that tundra, is now repoed. Now I'm making $1,100 a month. And now my daily routine is 350 milligrams of Adderall, three doctors in each city, Oxycontin, and now smoking weed every single night. That's what my disease now took me to. And now I was on my way out of baseball, and I was not a pro athlete no more, and I was on my way out of the game. But when baseball ended, now I had my whole life went to stadium after stadium after stadium, and I got paid because I picked the ball up and I threw it to a glove. Well, that was now stripped from me. So I'm looking at a new life at 31 years old, and I've never had a real job in my entire life, in my entire life. So because I was a pro athlete and I had pride and ego, I didn't want to start at the bottom anymore. I tried to start at the bottom at FedEx, and I didn't want to work. I didn't want to stretch out with the 18 year olds as they called me grandpa. I didn't want to do all that stuff. So I ended up gravitating towards methamphetamine, and now I'm doing more and more and more and more because the amphetamine was the only comfort that I had because of that first time that I did it, it disguised itself as heaven. I thought I needed it for the rest of my life. I ended up getting fired from that job. Now, when you have a massive drug addiction and you lose your job, you're going to start committing crime. So naturally, I started committing crime. You know, I started doing whatever I had to do to get dope. But then, about 33 years old, I put the needle in my arm. Now, this is what changed everything for me because I thought it was the best thing that was ever in the world. And for the first year, I could hit, I could find a band, and then all of a sudden, it turned to absolute hell for me. It was the most biggest nightmare I had ever lived in my entire life, and I was a lost soul on the planet. And now, at 37 years old, okay, I started this at 27 that first day with that one little 30 milligram of Adderall. And now I'm 37 years old, and now I'm an IV using heroin meth junkie, and I finally, because of the grace of God, I caught a felony. And I finally, because the Lord had other plans for me, I was facing three years of prison, and I ended up finally, because when you guys are out there struggling, if you let the right person in the room, if you let the right thing in the room, your life can be transformed. For so many years, I let women in the room, I let booze in the room, I let alcohol in the room, I, I, let, I let drugs. I let earthly pleasures enter the room. Now, finally, at 37 years old, because of the gift of desperation, I finally let the Lord in the room. I finally said, God, take my life. I surrender to you. And this is when I was in the county at Glen Helen. I did three months right there. And I finally surrendered to God. I said, take my life. Take my life. And I accepted everything that I had done in my entire life. I accepted what I had done and who I was at that moment. And then I finally was able to surrender to a higher power greater than me, which is Jesus Christ, who connected me to the King of Kings, to the Lord. And I'm so thankful for that. But I had to, I, I, I went into the uh, into jail and then I got sentenced to the Salvation Army. So after I finally let God in the room, this is the journey that he has taken me on. So I get sentenced to the Salvation Army for 365 days. And when I get to the Salvation Army, okay, I'm, I don't know what's going on. I've never believed in God my whole life. I continue to chase pleasures. I didn't want anything to actually do with God. But I get here and you're pumped with it. It's given to you every single day. You see it every single day. You see the graduates. You see the alumni. You see the change that they do. And I started to learn about two amazing weapons that you can only find from God. You'll never find them anywhere else on the planet. And that number one is you're going to find God's grace. So God's grace, you're going to finally feel forgiven given for everything that you've ever done in your entire life. Number two is he's going to equip you with faith. So you're going to stop future tripping. You're going to stop worrying about everything around you and you're going to start focusing on yourself. You're going to trust the mystery. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but if we put our faith in God and we continue to seize the moment with good intent, we will continue to be transformed from the inside out. These two weapons are equipped with you from God. When I was in the Salvation Army, my first month and a half, I was hanging clothes. I was hanging clothes. I was looking at the clock, hanging clothes, hanging clothes, hanging clothes. I didn't like it at all, but I had to start being comfortable, being uncomfortable. After about a month and a half, I got put as a truck helper, and I fell in love with sobriety. I fell in love with getting out there and doing the same thing with the whole, with the trucker and everything like that, and it amazed me. And then at an H&I panel one night, a guy asked me to come up and share the good news. And I shared my story for the first time. I had been so embarrassed with who I was. I used to be a pro athlete when I became a junkie. I had never shared my story. But now I share it all the time. I absolutely love to spread the good news. And now when I walk with God as I'm up here on this stage, I feel like God's telling me this is the reason why I saved you. I graduated from the Salvation Army after a whole year. And I stayed humble because I had to start at the bottom somewhere. So I went to the Hope House which is the bridge house for the San Bernardino Salvation Army. I started working at KE and Warehouse, waking up at 3.30 in the morning to ride my bike every single morning. It's a lot different when you're riding a bike for purpose. I did this for five months when I got out of the Salvation Army. And then I wanted to get back into treatment and be able to share my message because I felt like since I went here, it was like I went to the university 
of rehab. It was like I learned so much about recovery right here. I felt that I could go and help other addicts. So I ended up coming home from celebrating recovery, and I hear there's an open spot in San Diego for the resident manager spot. So I end up coming down here on a leap of faith. I come down here, and Carmelita, I knock on her door, and she looks at me like I'm crazy. At this time, I have a missing front tooth. You know, I'm just, I'm just, I look kind of washed up, I guess. You know what I'm saying? And she ends up, she ends up saying, "Well, we never had somebody just show up here and want a job." So I'll let, I'll let the captain know, Captain Paul and Captain Jennifer. I'll let them know. So I end up going home. I end up getting a call that night from Captain Paul, right? And he ends up having me come back down there and I end up interviewing with him, right? So then he offers me the job as a third key. So because I took a leap of faith and came down into San Diego, because I'm sensitive to the spirit, the Lord has blessed me tremendously. And I'll, and I'll share with you. So I come down here, right? And I work as the third key. So what you do is you work five days a week out, out at Poway on the donation site. And two days a week, you run the house. I was able to do the devotions like this two times a week. And that's my purpose. My purpose is to spread the good news. I moved down here. I meet my wife down here. I meet my wife down here. And now I'm married. I've been married for over a year. It's absolutely unbelievable. I created a whole new life down here in San Diego. I ended up getting, I ended up getting an opportunity to host a podcast called the 9890 Podcast which I'll show you the trailer here at the end so you guys have an avenue when you get out of here. You guys can search the search engine and you guys can see amazing stories of recovery. I'm now a soldier for the Salvation Army and I'm able to spread the good news up here. And I, mean, I, I work in treatment. I work in La Jolla Recovery. I'm completely out of treatment. I pay for my own rent. And these are the gifts that the Lord has given at me because of a change of perspective. How my day looked like back in my addiction. I woke up every day and I had to put a needle in my arm just to be the man that I hated. I had to put myself around people that I didn't even like. No Nobody could come through for me. It was an absolute disaster. I felt like I was, every door was closing, every door was closing until I was 37 years old and I was now living in a tent. Like I said, the gift of desperation changed my life. How my life looks like today, I wake up in the morning, I get with God right away. I say, thank you, Lord. And this started in the Salvation Army. About two months in, I started getting right here at the altar and I started getting with God early. Because when you wake up, the world is going to come at you. It's going to come at you with all these crazy things. And if you wake up and you fight through and you say, God, thank you, Lord, for saving my life. And you will always be thankful for the day that you finally chose him. Once you start to walk with God and you see the evidence in your life, you will look back and you will be so thankful for what that day was that you chose God. And you always remember, always remember the end of your addiction. Because what we suffer from is an obsession that tries to take you out and use one more. Now because of fentanyl, it's trying to take you out and it's trying to murder you. That's what the obsession is now doing. It's trying to kill you. If you're a fentanyl addict, you don't have much longer to live. I'll tell you that right now. I've seen 20 something people at my treatment center die over the last two years because they wanted to go out there and use one more. Once you get a little clean time, that's your enemy because you are not gonna be able to judge how much fentanyl you wanna use because what happens is once we put it in our body, we activate the phenomenon of craving and we can't can't stop. Did we suffer from an allergy and we don't break out in hives, we break out in handcuffs. You know what I'm saying? That's what happens to us because we're in the Salvation Army. That's our story. That's how our story ends up. I want to share a little bit of a Bible story, which I did share on Wednesday, but then I'm going to do this again, okay? There's a crippled beggar and he's on the temple steps, right? And he's on the temple steps and his whole life, his whole life, he's, all he's done was beg for money. Beg for money with the cup, right? Everybody in the town knows of this crippled beggar, and everyone in the town knows that all he does is beg for money. They all go into the temple, right? Peter and John see this crippled beggar from a distance, so they walk up over to him. As they get up to him, he sticks his cup out, and as he sticks his cup out, Peter goes, I don't have no money for you. He goes, I got something better for you. I got the living water. I got the Lord. I got the King of Kings. I got Jesus Christ for you. He goes, put the cup down. Stand up. The beggar stands up and he can't believe that he can walk. He can't believe that he can now run. He starts jumping for joy. He ends up running through the temple and because everybody in the temple knows that this is the crippled beggar, they can only believe that God did this in their life and in his life. The moral of this story is that put the cup down of addiction, put the cup down of alcoholism, put the cup down of criminal activity, put the cup down that has totally burdened your whole entire life. You're gonna graduate up here and you're gonna get this certificate up here and you're gonna be a graduate, right? And when you get out of here, everybody back where you are, where you came from in the society, they all know that we're junkies or we're alcoholics. They all know everything about us. But what God wants to do is he wants to shine through you. So when you go back into society, people are gonna ask, wow, how did Monty do that? He was a homeless junkie. 
How did he do that? And then you're able to open the avenue and you're able to tell them that God did this for me. The Lord did this for me. And the Lord wants to shine through you. God is hovering over this building right now. It's not about if he chooses you because he's not going to choose you. He's not going to choose you. You have to start to choose him. King David was an adulterer and a murderer, but his whole life he chose God. If he was a man after God's own heart, he always saw favor because he chose God. I know for me, 37 years of not choosing God, it took me to the depths of hell on this earth. Strung out junkie, 175 pounds, facing three years of prison, missing front tooth, looking like a cartoon character. To where the last three years and eight months, I've put in God first. And he has changed my life tremendously because of a change of perspective. I wake up every day with so much energy. I wake up with hope. I wake up with joy. And I'm so thankful. And hopefully one day me and my wife will become officers for the Salvation Army. And we'll be able to run one of these. But for right now, I'm going to continue to put God first one day at a time. Because just for today. Because today matters. If you have not let the Lord in your heart. If you have not given your life up to Jesus. Christ, I'm going to say a prayer right now, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to let the Lord to accept the Lord into your heart and go on this amazing journey that He wants to take you on. Bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this amazing, amazing place, the Salvation Army. Thank you, Lord, for these men. Thank you, Lord, for the fellowship. If, what, if someone's out there confused and they don't know what to do, just, just, ex, just have them accept you right now and let them surrender. Because when we surrender, there's something that happens on the inside of us when we start to feel calm and we start to feel faithful. Please, Lord, continue to let these men live just for today. Let them know that today matters, Father. And continue. If someone in here has walked away from God and they can't find their way back, know that you're always standing right there on the right or right there on the left. And you're always ready to have us choose you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for that we understand, that we live life forward, that we understand life backwards. We continue on this journey of sobriety. We will look back and our whole life will make sense and we will know how that you have had so much, had a part in our entire journey. As long as we walk with you, we will look back and we will have purpose and we will know that you were there the whole time. If we go back into our addiction, we will be lost and we'll be confused and we'll be struggling. I pray for the addict out there still suffering, that they continue to try to get better because there's a disease out there called addiction that's trying to play out the good times of your life and take you back out there and use one more. And now because of fentanyl, which is found in everything, and please, Father,